Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Tim, and it's my great privilege to uh, preach God's word to us this morning. Uh, how about we pray to begin? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the time that we can have now together in safety to read it together and sit under it. And we pray that you'd please help us this morning and change us by your spirit to be more like your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. What do you depend on? Now, towards the start of our time, uh, Naomi and my time here at the church this year, uh, Naomi took it upon herself to kind of revamp a little bit kind of the parents and kids room out there by buying some furniture, uh, which was not a factor in us actually then starting to have children. It's just how it happened. It was a coincidence. Um, but so she thought she'd, she'd grab some secondhand furniture off Facebook Marketplace and that sort of thing. Uh, and has anyone used Facebook Marketplace before and that kind of thing? Yes, a few people, cool. Um, so one of the things we found is that sometimes you'd message someone and say, hi, can I grab this couch that you're getting rid of or selling? Um, can I pick it up on this day at this time? And they'll say, yes, great. So you rock up at their house or wherever at the set time and they're there and you take it, done. Easy, very dependable. Other times, you message someone, say, hi, can I grab this? Is this available? Yes, it is. Cool. Can I pick it up at this time? Yeah, that'll be okay. And then, you know, you message them sort of an hour beforehand and say, hi, I'm coming at two o'clock. Um, still okay? <laughs> no response. I think, oh... We organised to pick it up, so I should, we should go and hopefully they'll see their phone when we get there. Hi, I'm just out the front. Are you there? Hello? <laughs> Please? No response? Okay, thanks, bye. An hour later, oh sorry, I lost track of time. <laughs> Not very dependable. I mean, I know it's hard because you don't know what that person's going through that day. You only have a very small kind of sliver of a window into their life. So you don't want to judge too hard. But from our perspective, that person's not dependable. And I know for myself, sometimes in life and ministry, I've been dependable for others. And other times I've let people down. But it's a good question to ask. Who do we depend on? Well, in Daniel chapter 6 this morning, we're going to see that God saves those who depend on him. And our dependency on him is shown in prayer. So we've got our first point this morning. Hopefully you can read that. It's a little bit small. Um, but our first point is the scheming of the officials. Now, if you remember back to last week in chapter 5, we had a regime change. So the Babylonians, under the, role, under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, are out. And the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, under the rule of Darius the Mede, in chapter 5, verse 31, is in. And now that Darius has conquered a new empire and gained all this new land, he thinks one of the first things that he should do is a bit of admin. So he appoints 120 satraps to govern kind of the land and the people under him, and then above them, three administrators to oversee those satraps. And Daniel is one of those three kind of chief administrators. And as we've come to expect from Daniel so far, if you have a look with me in chapter 6, verse 3, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, we know that the reason for his exceptional qualities is because God's spirit is in him, as we've read throughout Daniel. And inevitably, the rest of these satraps and administrators become jealous. They decide they need to get rid of this foreigner, you know, this Jewish leftover prisoner of war that they've inherited. They decide they need to get rid of him for good. So they all go as one big group all 120 of them apparently, to the king and say, may King Darius live forever. 
in verse 6 and 7, the royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or any human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. What a ridiculous request. No prayer across the empire for 30 days except to the king himself. And having a law with the death penalty signed in immediately that cannot be changed. Surely, Darius, if you don't mind me saying, you can see how ridiculous this decree is. Maybe think about it for a day or two. Ask Daniel, your best bud, because he's pretty wise. Maybe see what he thinks about it. Maybe take time to ask the satraps why they're trying to usher this in so quickly before, oh, you already signed it. Okay. Verse 9, King Darius put the decree in writing. He didn't ask any questions. He didn't think about it. He just, oh, okay, sure. Darius is portrayed here as an incompetent buffoon of a ruler. He's reckless and naive. He's easily manipulated by his scheming satraps. And knowing Daniel, as we do, there is no way that he is going to stop praying to his God to instead pray to a pagan human king, which means Daniel's in trouble. Our second point, the prayerfulness of Daniel. So what does Daniel do when he hears about this law? He goes home to pray. That's his automatic kind of knee-jerk reaction. Pray about it. Now, I have to confess that when something unexpected happens or something dangerous or unusual, something that you know, I'm not sure what to do about it, not that I've ever been in a situation like Daniel is, but my first response is rarely... I should pray about that. But it should be. Daniel knows who is truly in control and who he can depend on in times like this. Not the satraps or the officials, not Darius, but God. And right throughout the book of Daniel, as we've seen, the main message is that despite what things might look like, God is always in control. God is the one we found out in chapter 1 who gave Jerusalem over to the Babylonians. God is the one who humbled Nebuchadnezzar, who judged Belshazzar, and who brought Darius to the throne. Daniel knows God is totally in control, and so he takes his concerns to God. Verse 10. When Daniel learned that the, de that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Daniel isn't going out of his way to be deliberately persecuted. He doesn't have a martyr complex. He's giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. The satraps and the officials all know that Daniel is faithful. That's why they put this plan into practice, to trap him in the first place. He's got a reputation of being prayerful, so, of course, that's what he's going to do, even when his life is in danger because of it, especially when his life is in danger. And the satraps and the officials all know this. When they all barged into Daniel's house, what did they see? Verse 11, these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. They found Daniel doing exactly what they wanted him to be doing. Their trap worked. So in verse 12, they go again as one big group all back to the king again. They seem to travel everywhere in just a big group all the time. It's almost comical if it wasn't so sinister what they were trying to do. And they put the final step of their plan into play. Your Majesty, didn't you sign a decree only this morning saying that anyone who prayed to anyone else other than you, Your Majesty, great and wise, was to be, what were they to be done again? thrown into the lion's den. That's right. Yes. Didn't you sign that? Yes. I signed that this morning. You were all there. Don't you remember? <laughs> well, your majesty, your best buddy, Daniel, 
Such a shame, isn't it? He, we just saw him praying to his God, which means because you signed the decree, your majesty, we don't want to tell you what to do, but it looks like you're going to have to throw him to the lions. Well, that's, you know, what can you do? Who would have seen that coming? <laughs> Certainly not us. Verse 14, when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. This is a cliffside carving in Iran. It's 15 metres tall and 25 metres wide and 100 metres up the cliff. So I don't really know how they got there. Um, but it tells of the life and victories of King Darius I, who's the guy with the red arrow above his head. Now, there's two things to notice about this, this carving. First of all is that he is significantly taller than anyone else in the artwork. So you've got the people in front of him are his captured slaves or prisoners that he's defeated in battle. They're much shorter than he is. But even his own guards who are standing behind him, they're significantly shorter than him as well. And as well, I don't know if you can see, I might zoom in, but there's actually another one of his enemies on the ground under his foot. If we zoom in there. And so his height and his stance, I suppose, all show in this officially sanctioned Persian artwork that Darius has absolute power and authority over everyone else. So this is possibly the same Darius who Daniel's talking about here. And yet, what we read in this chapter of Daniel is a king who is easily manipulated by his nobles and is ultimately powerless to do anything to reverse his decree. The king made every effort until sundown to save Daniel, but it wasn't enough. Just as the officials and satraps gave all their energy to frantic scheming and plotting and planning to bring Daniel's downfall, so too does Darius frantically scheme and plot and plan to try to save Daniel, but to no avail. For all Darius's authority as the mighty king of the all-conquering Medo-Persian Empire, for all his power and persuasion and bureaucratic influence, he was completely powerless, trapped by his own law. The satraps and the officials remind him, probably with a big Cheshire cat grin on their faces, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. And so, defeated, Darius delivers Daniel to his demise in the den. The satrap's slimy scheme had worked. The king was duped into signing this law and there was no getting out of it for him. And as the sun went down, the satraps pat themselves on the back for a job well done. And that night, Darius is a complete wreck. He can't eat, he can't sleep. Whatever it is that the most powerful man in the world usually does on a night off, he can't enjoy any of it. And to build suspense for us as the readers of this story, did you notice we're not told anything about what's happening with Daniel at the moment? If this was a movie, the camera is only showing us Darius. We are meant to think what he's thinking, we're meant to feel what he's feeling. We're very deliberately not told anything about Daniel. Has his God rescued him or not? And it's not until the next morning that we, along with Darius, have our anxieties answered. Point four, the saving power of God. Verse 20, when Darius came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? What is it that Darius is expecting here? Probably silence. Maybe the belch of a couple of well-satisfied lions. But so far in this particular episode of chapter 6, you may have picked up on the fact that Daniel hasn't said anything. Except for him going home and praying, he hasn't actually done anything either. The satraps and the officials and the king have all been frantic in their planning and scheming and plotting and 
wanting things to happen. But Daniel hasn't been doing any of that. He's almost a side character. The point is that Daniel has quietly, completely trusted in his God, even to the point of certain death. And so it's significant when we read that Daniel does speak. Verse 21, Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. God has saved Daniel. And we're told the reason, A, because he was innocent before God and before Darius, and B, because he trusted in his God. And in a beautiful act of poetic justice, Those who had conspired against Daniel suffered the very fate they plotted for him. They and their families were thrown into the lion's den. In conclusion to the story, Darius then, probably with the help of Daniel, writes a letter to, apparently, everyone in the whole world about Daniel's God. Verse 26, he says, He is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. It's a fitting way to, not, to end not only chapter 6, but also the first half of the book as a whole. The story of Daniel is actually the story of Daniel's God, the one who rescues and saves. He saves his people who depend on him. And so in Daniel chapter 6, we actually see a glimpse of the saving power of God in the gospel. Just like Daniel, Jesus was an innocent man who was wrongly condemned by jealous enemies. Like Daniel, Jesus was given the death sentence, though he was innocent. And like Daniel, Jesus, after being condemned to death, is then raised up by God from the place of death. Now, I know in this chapter, Daniel doesn't die, but the theme of resurrection is actually kind of under the surface here, fully revealed in Jesus' resurrection. God saved Daniel from death. But did God save Jesus from death? Because Jesus died. The answer is that God did save Jesus from death, but not from dying. Jesus died. That's the whole point of the gospel. But by his resurrection, Jesus was saved from the place of death. He died, but he didn't stay dead. His body didn't decay, which is what usually happens when we die. God rescued Daniel here to show his people a glimpse forward 500 or so years into the future of the resurrection of Jesus. And from Jesus' resurrection, we have a confidence of our own bodily, physical resurrection from the dead, which is because Jesus rose from the dead. And so looking at Daniel 6 through the gospel we see that God saves those who depend on him. Because of the hope that God has given us in Jesus, God saves us. Perhaps not from dying, but from death. And what Daniel 6 in particular shows us is that the way that we show our dependency on God is in prayer. What did Daniel do when he heard the decree? He prayed, just as he had done before. It was his knee-jerk reaction. And so like Daniel, we must take our prayers and our worries and our concerns to God. We mustn't scheme or fret or worry like the satraps or like King Darius, but instead, pray. Now, I know for many of us, this is much easier said than done. It's hard to find the time to pray at the best of times, because each day is so busy and full with work or managing kids or studying or things that just kind of pop up at home or family or whatever else it happens to be. 
And somehow all of that seems to be cranked up to 11 at this time of year, with everything coming close to Christmas and having to organise family or holidays and buy presents or dealing with work, and suddenly it's already almost 2023, and... And then to know that we're supposed to also carve out time every day to pray, it can seem very overwhelming. If any of that resonates with you, especially, especially as if I've just rattled off those lists of things and you're thinking, oh, no, I've got to do that, and I've got to do that thing, that's right, oh, that person's coming here. I want to encourage you to keep at prayer. Maybe there are things that take up a large portion of your week that simply don't need to be there. And if those things are getting in the way of prayer, do something about it. American pastor and theologian John Piper once said, one of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from a lack of time. Ironically, he tweeted that (laughs) on Twitter. But the point still stands. Come before God in prayer. Put away your self-reliance and your pride and instead depend on him. At the beginning of every day, the end of every day, throughout the day, don't fret, don't scheme, don't worry. Hand it over to God. Like taking a few minutes to sharpen the kitchen knife before using it is time well spent in the long run, so too is taking time at the start of the day to bring your concerns to our strong and loving God. Sharpen the knife. Pray. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But I also know that for some of us, prayer is much harder than simply making time. Perhaps for you, there are days when life gets so hard that you can't even muster the energy to open your eyes and face the world. When words don't seem to form themselves in your mind or God seems distant or angry at you, if you feel plagued by guilt or despair or anxiety or anger, please know that God is close to you. He delights to listen to you and care for you and provide for you as a loving and generous father provides for his precious children, even if it doesn't feel like it. When you pour out your heart, even to the point of tears, for a family member to be healed of sickness, for a friend to put their trust in Jesus, for a child having a difficult time at school, for a spouse in the group of depression, and it seems like God doesn't answer. What then? Well, I don't know why God chooses to answer prayers in particular ways. But I do know what God's word says. It says that he is always good, he wants to listen to our prayers, and he is always working for our good, mysteriously and wonderfully, to make us more like Jesus, which is the greatest good there could possibly be. So in times when you don't know what else to do, feed your soul with God's life-giving words and let them shape your prayers. I personally have found great benefit in maybe going somewhere where I feel relaxed and calm and comfortable and at peace and reading a psalm or a few verses out of a a book of the Bible or even some of the prayers that are written in Scripture for us, like Daniel chapter 9 is a, a great prayer, only a couple of pages over, and letting then what I read shape how I pray. So God speaks to me in his word and I speak back to him in prayer. And I found as well that writing out my prayers can help me to slow down and think deliberately about what I'm praying. It's a bit harder to get distracted that way. And I've also been encouraged reading the prayers of other Christians throughout history who are often so much better at praying than I am. But the point is, as an individual and as a family, show your dependency on him and pray. As Daniel's story points us forward to Jesus, 
so too let our own hardship or experiences point us to Jesus and his prayers in his suffering. In the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he died, on the cross as he died, he still entrusted himself to his Father and depended on him completely. And God saved him from death. So as God's people, we who depend on him, who have been who have been saved from death, let us not lose sight of the bigger picture. The hope we have of a resurrected life won for us by Jesus on the cross, a hope even greater than death. Let us not depend on ourselves, on our own efforts, or on scheming or plotting or frantic planning to get what we think that we need. Rather, like Daniel, like Jesus, depend completely on our God and Father, the one who is completely trustworthy, who delights to answer our prayers for our good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you love us and you delight to listen to us and you give us all that we need. Lord, please help us to be like Daniel, to be like the Lord Jesus and to depend on you even when it seems like all around us is chaotic and it seems like you're not in control. Help us to hold firm to your word and know that you are in control and you're always working for our good.